Well, hello and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Megan Minoka Hill. I'm from the Oneida Nation of Wisconsin. I am the director of the Honoring Nations program and also the executive director of the Harvard Project on American Indian Economic Development at the Kennedy School's Ash Center for Democratic Governance and Innovation. And we're so excited for uh, you all to be with us for this virtual gathering called On the Front Lines, Tribal Nations Take On COVID-19. Um, we've had a terrific uh, response so far. I, I think almost 300 people have registered for this event, so we really appreciate you taking uh, time out of your day to join us. We have a, a really exceptional panel today, um, each of whom have been working tirelessly over the last several months in a variety of really critical uh, capacities to support uh, American Indian nations and their citizens as we all face this, this crisis. So um, we're incredibly fortunate to have them join us and I'd like to introduce them. We'll start with uh, Governor Stephen Lewis, who is the governor of the Gila River Indian community. Uh, he's also a Kennedy School alum from the MPA program of 2006. Uh, and he's joining us from his nation in Arizona. We've got uh, Dr. Laura Hammett, who is the Director of Infectious Disease Programs at the Johns Hopkins University Center for American Indian Health. And she's joining us from Durango, Colorado. We also have Professor Joe Colt, who is the Ford Foundation Professor Emeritus of International Political Economy. He's also the co-founder and co-director of the Harvard Project on American Indian Economic Development. And he's joining us from Tucson, Arizona. And rounding out the panel, we have Mr. Del Labrador, who is a citizen of the nation. He's joining us from his home in Montana. Uh, he's an attorney and he's the former acting assistant secretary, principal deputy assistant secretary and deputy assistant secretary for Indian affairs at the US Department of Interior. And I'm really uh, grateful uh, to each of you for taking the time to, to join us out of what I know are very, very uh, busy schedules. So just a note on the format, um, I'll start off by asking each panelist a couple of questions um, uh, and they'll respond. And then once we hear from them, I will open it up to the audience. Um, we really do wanna hear from you. So please submit any questions uh, that you have in the text box. Uh, so, so to start us off, I'd like to, to begin with Governor Lewis. Um, your leadership and uh, Gila River's response to the crisis has really been remarkable. And, and personally, I've been so impressed with um, your communications and your social media presence to convey information to your citizens. Um, I'm wondering if you might be able to talk a little bit about reopening. I know it was just Memorial Day weekend. Um, things are opening around me here in Boston, and I know tribal nations are reopening. And I understand that Gila River is open business enterprises on, on May 14th. Um, I wonder if you might be able to talk about some of the protocols that you put in place. Um, how is that going? What have you learned? Uh, what's going well? And sort of any challenges you might have? Well, well, thank you. And it's, it's really an honor to, to be here and at least to share my community story. Uh, we, we did open uh, May, actually May, May 15th on a Friday. Uh, the, our community council voted uh, to open our, our gaming enterprises. And, and basically, uh, you know, we were definitely monitoring uh, both from the federal level, the National Indian Gaming Commission standards, as well as uh, looking at uh, our other tribal uh, gaming enterprises and, and from, from other tribal nations in Arizona, um, you know, I, as, as tribal leaders, I think one of the things that I really, since this pandemic began, uh, you know, I could reach out to my fellow uh, tribal leaders and, and we, we talk, uh, you know, we support each other, you know, and, um, uh, and we learn from each other in, in, in our responses, you know, to uh, this ongoing pandemic um, from different tribal nations. And that has really been uh, something that, that, that I value, I, you know, just the, uh, really those, these stories of, of resiliency and, uh, you know, stories of just having to, to deal uh, with a, a pandemic absence, really a federal response. And those that responsibility has fallen, as we've heard in the news, 
to state governors, but really in Indian country, that's fallen to tribal leaders themselves to come up with very innovative, sometimes entrepreneurial, sometimes uh, as, as, as uh, Professor Kalt would say, you know, really that, uh, that kick A type of sovereignty decision-making uh, to protect their tribal members. Uh, and, and for us, what we looked at in regards to early on, we knew that testing was going to be critical for protecting our most vulnerable. Uh, we looked at tracing, uh, contact tracing, and, and, and looking at, especially from, from uh, an, those uh, asymptomatic cases of our community members, of course, that did not show any symptoms and that were potentially, could potentially spread that, you know, to others in their families, to their villages, uh, to our elders. And so we put resources um, into testing um, as, as immediately as we could from our, from IHS funding that we have through our, our we have, we run our own Gila River Healthcare uh, as a self-governance tribe. And also from that first CARES Act funding, we use those resources uh, from that CARES Act funding, and we put that into testing. And so, of course, you know, as, as most tribal nations, you know, our, our tribal enterprises um, are the majority of, uh, of, of the resources that we use to run our tribal government, to provide those essential services to our tribal membership. For us, it's over 75% uh, of, of revenue that keeps our tribal government going from our tribal enterprises. So, so we looked at a way where we could do it in a very phased, carefully thought out reopening plan. And testing uh, was the backbone of that. We um, identified uh, a testing agency, um, Steward Healthcare Systems in Arizona, who had the capacity to do a number of tests uh, that we were uh, able to test all of our gaming employees and put them on a two week regimen where we would it wouldn't be a one-off. It would be a continually testing regimen uh, of uh, over 1,800 employees. Um, and so that with realigning uh, our gaming floor to make social distancing. I know it's hard on a gaming floor, but you know what we, uh, our gaming team separated uh, the, uh, the, the tables and the slot machines. Uh, in addition, we had PPE as well. So we had masks for all employees and we had, we had a supply of masks for every patron that needed masks. Um, luckily, most of those patrons uh, from that beginning weekend uh, had masks already. So, um, you know, so having adequate PPE, making sure that we could provide social distancing within the gaming floor and mandatory testing, uh, that was uh, the strengths of our reopening that uh, our council, uh, I, I, we have a 17 member council, myself and, and uh, as governor and lieutenant governor. And so with that, uh, the, the council uh, as a phase reopening, of course, the hotels, the restaurants would be closed. Uh, we also had, uh, uh, we uh, moved some of our employees to what we call the cleaning team. They're called the green team. They have green shirts on. And so once uh, a player's club card is taken out of a slot machine, they're alerted to that fact and they go and they wipe down the machine uh, or they clean um, respectively the, uh, the blackjack tables if they leave, uh, if a patron leaves. So, you know, so we, we you know, we put a lot of, of measures in place and, and uh, uh, you know, a, a number of, uh, of tribal, other tribal gaming facilities have come to, to look at our reopening plan as a result. And so we're happy to, we're happy to share our, our story and, and our, our reopening plan and, and our continual plan to, to keep our employees and our patrons safe. Yeah, that's great. I think um, you had mentioned that, that a lot of the strength comes from learning from each other, tribal nations learning from each other, and, and that really resonates with me. And so thank you for, for sharing that. I might um, pivot to uh, Dr. Hammett. Um, the governor just talked about, you know, testing being at the forefront of what they were thinking about in terms of reopening. Can you talk a little bit about testing throughout Indian country and sort of resource available and sort of what you're seeing across Indian country in that respect? Sure, thank you. And, and I want to just applaud Governor Lewis. He's been such 
um, an instrumental leader in, in thinking through this and recognizing that testing has to be the cornerstone of a reopening uh, plan and being really proactive for the community there to identify in the absence of you know, some national leadership around this um, and a national testing strategy really putting one in place um, for the tribe there. And I think that's what um, needs to be happening and is happening in other tribal communities. And I think Governor Lewis's willingness to share how they've thought about it is incredibly helpful so that people can learn from one another. We know that controlling the pandemic really demands finding the infected people, isolating them until they can no longer spread disease. Um, we know that we need to have rapid case notification um, and isolation and then contact tracing and testing um, and supported quarantine and isolation, particularly for communities where that may be difficult to accomplish. And so I think, you know, we've, we've heard nationally that there are shortages in testing supplies, and that's absolutely something that's affecting Indian country um, very deeply. There are, there are shortages in being able to get those tests out and to be able to do what Governor Lewis has implemented on Gila River, where they have actually a serial testing for, uh, you know, essential workers, people that they're actually having come back into the workplace. Um, being able to identify asymptomatic cases um, and early and quickly, and then isolate them and prevent them to, from spreading to other people is really um, essential in order to slow the spread and, and prevent further surges in disease uh, this, this fall, or through the summer and through the fall as well. I think many people across Indian country, many um, tribal facilities have been given access to the Abbott ID Now platform, which is a rapid point of care testing platform, which can be very useful. There are supply chain challenges um, with that platform. Um, there's a new FDA warning out as well about that platform that there is a higher um, percentage of false negative tests with that platform. And so there is a recommendation now in place that anybody using that would do an, a, a second swab with confirmatory testing if there is a negative that's been identified. So I think there it does take a unified approach as much as possible to really be able to advocate for a rational, consistent um, testing strategy that can be implemented across tribal nations. Certainly on Navajo Nation, we see that individual service units have different supply levels and are, are implementing different testing um, measures in accordance with what their supply levels are, but that can be very confusing for, for both providers and the population when that changes on a on a day-to-day -day basis. So um, I, I absolutely agree that testing is a cornerstone that we need to be advocating for as much as possible for those resources to be made available to uh, tribes uh, who have sovereignty and who can develop comprehensive plans that will best suit their communities. Mm -hmm. Can you also sort of expand on, uh, we know that the infection rate in Indian country is particularly high and it's hitting native communities um, disproportionately. Can you talk a little bit about why that is, maybe some of the unique characteristics of Indian country and, and sort of what that larger impact looks like and in, in as we think about sort of these testing and, and finding these resources? Yeah, I think, thanks for that question. I think it's absolutely true that we're seeing higher rates of disease in Indian country. Um, we know that this is the case, you know, for pneumonia and influenza, even at baseline, not, you know, outside of a pandemic setting, we, we know that we see higher rates of influenza for, of pneumonia, um, and importantly, of other underlying conditions. So things like diabetes and obesity and heart disease and lung disease that make people more susceptible uh, to COVID-19 infection and make them more susceptible for severe outcomes um, as well. And so I think it's really a combination of factors that largely um, revolve around poverty. And, and when we have communities that are heavily impacted by poverty, um, where there's a lot of uh, low nutrient, uh, high processed food diets, and we have some of these other you know, risk factors that ensue from that, um, when we have communities where there's a lot of household crowding, um, we see quick spread of, of disease and transmission of disease within those more crowded households. And so I think all of these things help to explain, you know, why we're seeing a higher burden of disease. Um, but it, it's, unfortunately, it's really just shining a light on what we already know, <laughs> that we have longstanding inequities. Um, in tribal communities and that there are already, you know, at baseline higher rates of infectious diseases. Um, so I'm, I'm very much hoping that um, 
this is a reality that everybody in Indian country already is aware of, but hopefully it can, this, the COVID-19 pandemic can shine a light on this and bring more resources to bear on addressing these longstanding inequities. Yeah, it, it seems like any sort of cracks in the, in, in the system have really sort of highlighted these sort of very deep chasms in, in some of these systematic issues that we have in Indian country. And certainly that's the case in, in um, healthcare. Yes. Um, Professor Call, sort of switching gears to looking at the economic impact, we heard Governor Lewis talk about 75% um, of uh, revenues coming from tribal enterprises uh, fund, fund um, the tribe. Can you talk a little bit about the economic impact of COVID-19 across Indian country? I know that um, the Harvard Project and Native Nations Institute have released these policy briefs. Um, I'm wondering if you can you can talk about that and also sort of the impact regionally. Oh, you're on you're on mute, Joe. Now I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you for having us and for putting this on. Uh, it's an important set of discussions. I think the way to think about the economic impact is exactly where Governor Lewis started, which is people need to realize that. Tribal governments under our federal system are sovereigns and they perform and have responsibilities for, for providing their citizens with basically all the services and programs that we expect of any state and local government from sanitation and healthcare to uh, housing programs, environmental protection, tribal police and fire departments, the whole array of services uh, are, are really and in, in, in Governor Lewis used the word self-governing responsibilities of tribes. But unlike the state and local governments around the tribes who have traditional tax bases, income taxes, property taxes, sales taxes, and so forth, um, tribes lack those, those traditional tax bases. And so uh, as they've grown and, and, and taken on more and more responsibility for all these services and programs, uh, they've had to rely, again, as Governor Lewis said, on their tribal enterprises, whether they be gaming or non-gaming enterprises. People don't realize that less than, less than half the tribes have gaming operations. So a lot of tribes are relying on non-gaming operations. But whether it's gaming or non-gaming, tribes are looking to their version of what many states do. State governments routinely now have big gaming operations, big gaming businesses called the state lotteries. And the state governments uh, tell us that the purpose of those lotteries is to raise money to help fund governmental services. In the case of the tribes, those kinds of gaming and non-gaming revenues are central to their ability to provide their citizen <coughs> services. Um, well, so given that, um, the impact, you know, really starting in, in mid-March, early March to mid-March, the impact on tribes has really been devastating because the all the as of about uh, uh, March, uh, I'm sorry, uh, May 15th, um, not a single tribal casino was operating. Um, and then we saw some, open, saw, saw some opening up. Tribe after tribe after tribe, every single one of them who had a gaming operation, um, passed ordinances, adopted social distancing regulations and so forth and shut down uh, their gaming enterprises. Similarly, many non-gaming enterprises, the restaurants, the, the resorts, the anything tourism related has been shut down. Um, and then many of the, even the manufacturing facilities uh, in many cases that tribes have uh, and other operations were, were shut down. But when you did that, you cut tribal revenue essentially to zero almost immediately. Um, and um, uh, this left tribes then uh, just desperate to try to provide not only support for the employment in their enterprises, but be able to just keep their tribal governmental programs, the health clinic, the, the police department, the fire department up and running at full force. Um, and as Governor Lewis mentioned at Gila River, it sounds like about 75% of all the funding uh, uh, comes from uh, the tribe itself, its own tax revenues essentially on itself. Um, and in fact, the United States Civil Rights Commission last year released a report. The, the federal base of funding is actually extremely meager. People think that tribes are wholly dependent on the federal government. Um, the federal government's own data, they came out and said um, 
that this is actually, actually I think they used the the word embarrassing at one point that uh, the federal government support for the tribes was just was just meager and in fact less than the federal government support of state and local governments um, in the even the pre-pandemic period. So tribes have been devastated by the fact that uh, their core governmental operations are under threat. Their business operations are largely have largely been closed and are slowly reopening with the kinds of care that uh, Governor uh, Lewis talks about. We hope that it's a safe reopening, but I, I know that the governor and all the tribal officials that we talk to are very concerned that they not touch off another round of hotspots and, and, and so forth. Um, so at any rate, the, the bottom line then is that these tribes, not just their economies, but their ability of those, the ability of those economies to feed the tribal government has just been devastated. Uh, we intervened a little bit in some of the Treasury Department's deliberations. And on, based on our research, we found that tribal economies were contributing immediately prior to the pandemic, for the year leading up to the pandemic, about hundred just under $130 billion to the US economy. Um, and more than a million jobs in the US economy, either directly tribal government or tribal enterprises, or indirectly the spillover effects when a worker for the tribe goes out and goes to the local grocery store that uh, helps support the grocery store and its employees. And when you looked at the direct and spillover effects, more than a million jobs in the US economy are accounted for by tribes. More than 900,000 of those jobs are non-Indians. Mm -hmm. um, so that um, the economies in which around the tribes, where the states and the counties and so forth, where tribes are embedded, tribes are now quite often the anchor uh, for the whole region around them. Um, and uh, as our state and local governments, tribes um, uh, make payments in lieu of taxes, they're called, um, payments in lieu of taxes to states. Uh, all the workers pay federal income tax and so forth and so on. Um, we calculated that almost $10 billion of state and local tax revenues and other tax payments in lieu of taxes by tribes were basically under threat and in many cases now being cut off and another $16 billion of federal revenues. So tribes are, are not just dependent on these economies but other economies are dependent on tribes. And all of that has been under tremendous pressure and the need has turned out to be huge in Indian country uh, because you couple the devastation to the economy and the tribal governments with the disease rates that uh, uh, Dr. Hammett mentions, you've got obviously a real crisis. Yeah, absolutely. Sort of given that, I mean, the, the regional impact is, is staggering. Um, I'm wondering, um, Governor Lewis, sort of in light of this, I'm wondering if, what your communications have been with other tribes in the area, uh, the city of Phoenix, the governor of Arizona, how have you all sort of uh, collaborated and communicated on sort of issues around reopening and, and COVID? Right, um, and, and I think what's important also was, is that um, uh, for our healer of the healthcare systems, we, we run that um, in, independently of the IHS. Uh, and um, we also, we, we have, a, we're, a tribe of 23,000 tribal members. And our service area takes into account 100,000 um, Native Americans. You know, Phoenix, uh, Metropolitan Phoenix is one of the largest uh, urban centers as well. And then uh, home to, you know, the one of the largest tribes, the Navajo Nation, uh, as well as the tribes that are surrounding. Um, and so um, I think it's important to note that we've, we, we have tested and over um, 70 case, positive cases um, in our Gila River health, uh, healthcare, and uh, only 15 are uh, community members, and the rest are members from, from other tribes that are presenting themselves to be tested and, and, and that uh, have come back as positive uh, tests as well. So, you know, so for, for the Gila River Indian community, you know, we, we, we look at how we're surrounded, um, you know, by uh, not only the county, as well as uh, the the larger state, and of course the, the state of Arizona was one of the uh, probably the you know uh, even now there they they rank they, they lag in regards to testing per capita 
in the state. And, and so tribes bear the brunt of that. And I think that was one of the things that really pushed us uh, to look, you know, innovatively for uh, using our and, and leveraging our, our, our first COVID-19 funding that we got from the, from the tribal relief fund to a very comprehensive um, testing plan. Um, you know, of course, you know, we, um, where we were in communication with, uh, with the governor of Arizona. And uh, of course he has come down with his own, that's Governor Ducey, uh, his own um, uh, testing protocols and his executive orders. But also, I've also issued my own executive orders per our constitution as well. Um, sometimes mirror the state of Arizona, other times are, are you know, uh, I think more, more strict as well. Uh, and um, also, uh, and, and I know a lot of the tribes uh, in Arizona, the tribal leaders that, that we've talked, I've talked with, they've also very early on for Gila River, uh, I instituted my COVID-19 task force uh, in the end of January. And uh, that was an incident uh, response um, approach where I brought in uh, both our first responders from the community, uh, our Gila River Healthcare, our Office of Emergency Management, uh, and uh, our, our, our tribal uh, public health as well, uh, and uh, use them as a, as a strategy team to mount our response uh, very early on uh, in January. And uh, that's taking into account uh, the, uh, of course, the CDC guidelines, the federal guidelines, as well as the state guidelines, but also what are our guidelines going to be for the community? And that's what tribal leaders uh, I'm proud of the tribal leaders for determining for themselves, you know, what, uh, what standards um, that are appropriate to their specific needs as well. For the Gila River Indian community, we have one of the highest instances of type 2 diabetes, uh, not only across Indian country, but, uh, but, but across the United States. And, and uh, you know, of course, you know, we've been, a, uh, sadly, we've been a case study of type 2 diabetes. We have a number of our elders uh, and uh, uh, members overall who are on dialysis as well. So, you know, they have those suppressed immune systems. Uh, and, and so, you know, and we have a large number of our elders. And so we, and so, you know, we have a significant uh, number of our community members who fit into that, um, that, that, um, that category uh, that, that is, uh, that would be very um, open to catching COVID-19. It would be devastating. Um, and so, uh, though, and so, that was one of the things we looked at. You know, we looked at how can we protect our most vulnerable populations first early on. Um, and, and of course, uh, it was important to message that to our community members as well. Uh, from our first case, I remember, uh, our first case I went on and I did a video message uh, to my community members and uh, announcing that and talking about just how uh, you know, important it is to wear a mask, important it is to wash your hands, important it is to social distance. Um, and that first video uh, became so, uh, you know, to my community members, um, both on and off the reservation, uh, it became so critical to get that communication and that education of this pandemic uh, out, to, out to, to our community members. Uh, at, at a, you know, on social media, uh, we have... Um, also our own tribal um, uh, uh, TV station as well. So it was important. And then it, it became a series uh, of video messages at the beginning, almost every night, talking about, you know, what are the number of our positive cases, um, you know, talking about continually um, uh, washing your hands and social distancing uh, as everyday um, patterns to protect yourself and to protect, you know, your elders. Because as we know, we all live in multi, uh, in, in Indian country. Um, we have, you know, uh, many of our house, households are households are multi generational families. So we have elders uh, as well as we have children as well uh, living uh, in 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 our in the same household. So you know, so so the the, the transmission, uh, if one if one member one family member got that, would be devastating to a household, and then to our villages and then to our districts and then to our, our own community. So we saw that this early on, uh, that uh, my, my uh, tribal leadership, our council members, uh, our own health team, as well as our first responders knew that this could 
burn through our community very fast uh, if started. And so we had to uh, really uh, put down uh, measures early on uh, to, to protect a, a, you know, a, a potential uh, hotspot or clusters within our community. And so testing uh, and, and uh, contact tracing was uh, critical to that. Uh, just a quick reminder to those in the audience, if you do have any questions, um, please put them into the, the chat box and we'll be sure to share them with um, our panelists. I want to sort of uh, build on what the governor was saying about um, sort of putting in place uh, ordinances to keep communities uh, safe and, and, and uh, pivot to, to Dell, I know that you are on the forefront of, of a number of these legal battles and we've been seeing in the news sort of an antagonistic situation in South Dakota where that particular governor is trying to force two tribes to, to remove their roadblocks that are essentially keeping their, their citizens safe. Um, what can you sort of tell us about that from a legal, legal perspective when, when tribal nations have different safety ordinances than, than the states and, and does it have, you know, yeah, well, uh, <clears throat> thank you, Megan. And I think just as uh, Governor Lewis had mentioned, sometimes they're looking at what the governor does, uh, what other local officials may be doing. And other times they know they've got to act more quickly whenever um, the, the need arises. And of course, during this pandemic, what you're seeing, I think, is across Indian country, um, a really active, um, proactive view of tribal sovereignty to protect the health and welfare of all their citizens. And to the extent that they can coordinate with other governments, um, you know, some of the orders do look the same. Uh, in other cases, they may not have the resources to address a, um, an outbreak so that they have to have more protective measures. And I think we can give a few examples um, of where it's worked and where it hasn't. You're pointing to the one where, it, where there's a, a lot of conflict uh, between the governor in South Dakota and the, uh, in particular, Cheyenne River Sioux, but also Oglala. And in that case, um, they're doing roadblocks and stay-at-home orders so that they can prevent any outbreaks from happening. And they've been stopping folks on the highways to um, more or less ask them questions of where they're going, is it essential, um, why are you passing through, and basically exercising their own police powers in order to protect the health and welfare and prevent an outbreak. Um, in that case, the governor um, has uh, people around them asking the, the BIA, sending in letters, asking for legal guidance. Can they do this? Can they do this on, on state and federal highways? And you end up in a, in a jurisdictional kind of battle over who has authority over what types of highways. And ultimately it's led to uh, uh, a May 8th letter from the governor to Cheyenne River saying, We've got three options and I, I need you to act and listen to what I'm saying. And then as they said, we'll take it into consideration. Then a subsequent letter went out by the governor to the White House, uh, Department of Justice and Department of Interior saying we need federal intervention. Um, we think they probably have jurisdiction over the tribal and BIA roads. And we're saying they do not have jurisdiction over the state and federal. And um, that's where it stands at this point. And I think the tribes are doing rightfully so what they can under their own constitutions, under their own powers to protect their people. And they feel as though the governor is interfering with that. And she's making a case that it's affecting commerce and it's, um, it's affecting uh, people's ability to travel through the state. Um, contrast that situation, which is in conflict with Say, for example, in New Mexico, northern New Mexico, as we've been pointing out with the Navajo Nation, city of Gallup, um, the governor of New Mexico there. And the governor invoked uh, a, a, an old at riot control act in order to help control the spread of the virus. And in that case, even though Gallup is off the Navajo reservation, you have coordination between local officials, the governor and the Navajo Nation, all working towards trying to control what is uh, a severe outbreak and a, a very severe problem, health problem for everyone involved. Um, and just to give you a third example out here in Montana, had a very proactive governor who uh, did stay at home orders very early on. Um, the tribes largely did the same. Sometimes they were the same, sometimes they were different. And interestingly enough, the, the outbreak was handled. 
It's been uh, one of the lowest per capita infection rates and hospitalizations in the country. And yet you have tribes who have continued their stay at home orders and also not allowed people in unless they were essential. And in fact, as the state of Montana's uh, stay at home order expired on April 24th, you had, for example, Northern Cheyenne extend theirs to May 31st and the Crow Nation extend theirs to June 15th. And in, and in fact, uh, Crow still has some checkpoints at some tourist hotspots um, near the, the Bighorn Canyon and, and the battlefield. And there's no conflict between the governor and tribal leaders. In that case, they're both recognizing each other's sovereignty and their ability to prevent until there is all of the mechanisms that Governor Lewis and um, others have, which is the testing, tracing, all the things that you can to address and prevent. And now those types of things are coming in, but they had to issue these stay at home orders and protect their citizens until those resources became available. Yeah, the, the threats just seem so counterproductive in that, you know, we need to move move ahead together, sort of protecting the health of, of all our citizens for, for the well being of, of all of our communities together. Um, I wonder if you might be able to also comment on another um, bit of litigation that we're seeing in Washington having to do with the inclusion of the Alaska Native Corporations in, in the, the CARES Act. I wonder if you might be able to um, tell us sort of where things stand from your perspective on that front. Yeah, thank you for the question again. And I guess just for um, the audience to have context, uh, so there, there have been four different bills by Congress that have gone out to address the pandemic. Um, the first two had some minimal set aside monies for Indian country to address it. And there were a number of problems, um, for example, working with the uh, CDC and they didn't have a mechanism to transfer money out to tribes. And so as we were monitoring all of this and the resources were lacking, uh, there were, you know, hundreds of advocates across Indian country that were um, talking to members of Congress, uh, working with tribal leaders and other local officials, and they came up with um, the fourth bill by Congress uh, called the CARES Act. And in the CARES Act, there was a set aside called a, a government stabilization fund of $150 billion. Of that $150 billion, $8 billion was set aside for, for uh, tribal nations. Uh, during that time, uh, after the bill was passed, then Treasury and Interior had a joint consultation with Indian country and tribal leaders, of which Governor Lewis participated and many, many tribal leaders. Uh, after that consultation in roughly mid-April, um, Interior and Treasury made the decision to include Alaska Native corporations in the, the $8 billion bucket for the tribal nation set aside. That in turn triggered a series of lawsuits and litigation, which were all consolidated into one case and in um, the federal district court in Washington, DC. And after uh, the hearing uh, arguments on both sides, in that case, the federal judge made a ruling that said that ANCs were not tribal governments under a series of federal laws. And so that that needed to be set aside if they were going to appeal and Interior and Treasury decided that, yes, we still think despite the judge's ruling that ANCs should be entitled to this relief fund and they're going to pursue an appeal of litigation. And so all of that is still ongoing and that will be decided sometime next month, ultimately when the appeals court decides and then remands it back to the, to the lower court and the agencies proceed whether they're in or not. Um, <clears throat> interestingly enough, there are other cases that have happened since then asking for the, the, the uh, Department of Treasury to move forward with the allocations for the rest of Indian country because they needed them to do the things that Governor Lewis is talking about, which is get the resources, the testing, the tracing, et cetera, from the stabilization fund. And as that started to trickle out um, after the hearing in the case, there was another case set of cases and not to um, um, convolute everything, but it was to ask for the distributions to move forward um, even with this other question that was outstanding. And so the uh, treasury started to go with the allocations and then we found uh, a number of problems with that on the formula used because they had requested uh, tribal nations to gather together a set of four different sets of factors, including population, employment, um, expenditures, uh, 
uh, et cetera. And Treasury decided to use the Department of Housing and Urban Development Fund instead of what tribal nations had submitted, um, and which became a problem. And so what happened was there was over-including and under-including. And there were some 30 plus tribal nations that got the very minimum allocation, were undercounted under the formula used. And then there were some tribal nations that had overcounts of their housing uh, population. And so they got more money than they actually were entitled to. And so they're, you know, it's a to be determined on what's gonna happen uh, going forward. But ultimately there's, um, you know, there's gonna have to be a lot of questions that need to be answered. Yeah, absolutely. The The question of equi equi equitability is a, is a big one. And I know, Joe, the third policy brief that was released on Friday really um, tried to get at what an equitable distribution of CARES Act funds is. I'm wondering what you can tell us about that. Um, sure. Um, and as Dell mentioned, the uh, CARES Act monies have started, they started to distribute them, but then there's all this litigation going on. And Treasury is representing that it's working hard to, to get out the next round of, of allocations uh, of these funds that are appropriated for tribal governments. Um, and to do that, realistically and fairly, you need a, a usable formula um, uh, there are 574 tribes, tribal governments that uh, are, if you will, in the bucket, to use Dell's word, and um, coming up with a formula that would be fair to all of those is, of course, a, a pretty tricky thing. Plus, you have to be administratively feasible. Uh, you're not realistically, in, in a, in a pre under the pressure of a, a, an immediate crisis and pandemic, you're not going to realistically go out and audit every tribe and, and somehow come up with uh, highly detailed ways of allocating money. So uh, Treasury acknowledges that, that they need to be relatively straightforward and administratively uh, feasible in whatever they do, but they also need to be fair. And so what we've worked on at the Harvard Project and the Native Nations Institute is uh, a formula that we propose that Treasury use. Um, <clears throat> under that formula, uh, the kinds of information that Dell mentioned the federal government has already asked for um, and tribes have been submitting, uh, the number of citizens of the tribe, the enrolled membership of the tribe, uh, the number of employees in both the tribal government and tribal enterprises, the, their land bases, um, and uh, uh, measures of expenditures that have been made so far um, have been submitted and are being submitted by tribes. Um, so we propose to use that information um, to create a three-factor formula. Uh, that formula would weight uh, directly the citizenship numbers of the tribe. Governor Lewis, what, what's your total enrolled uh, citizenship? Did you say 23,000 enrolled? What, what are you enrolled? Yeah, yes, yeah, just over 23,000, Professor. So use, the, use, something, use that for Gila River and for all the tribes, find their population numbers, number one get their employment numbers for all the employees of uh, uh, the tribal government, as well as the tribal enterprises. I think uh, Governor Lewis mentioned 1800 employees just in your, in your, in your uh, gaming operations. So collect that kind of data. Uh, tribes are making uh, expenditures daily now in trying to combat the pandemic, collect that information. Um, and uh, basically have information on employment, population, and uh, expenditures. Expenditures are particularly difficult, however, because the law that we're talking about here that Dell talked about, the CARES Act, uh, uh, is supposed to cover expenditures from March 1st, 2020 to December 30th, 2020. Well, we're not even close to December 30th yet. <laughs> we're in May. And so you have to have some method of estimating those expenditures. At any rate, so we propose a formula that would put 60% weight on the enrolled citizens of the tribes, 20% um, weight on their total employment of tribes, tribal governments and tribal enterprises, and 20% weight on expenditures. And let me talk briefly just about those. For the 60% weight on population, as I've said, use the enrolled citizenship of the tribes. Many tribes, and Gila River is one of them, for example, um, have a large number 
of their citizens who live off reservation. Um, they live in the city of Phoenix, for example, and as Governor Lewis said, he still has to serve them because <laughs> they presented the tribal health clinic. I'm sure they come for other services and so forth. So tribes have, as sovereign governments, have responsibilities uh, and duties owed and jurisdiction over uh, those citizens. So we say use the entire tribal citizenry. Um, the first round allocation that Dell discussed um, used essentially the on-res population, the on-reservation population, but that doesn't capture the entirety of the citizens to which a tribal government is responsible for and has jurisdiction over. Um, secondly, with respect to employment, um, I've already mentioned um, and our research shows how important tribal employment is to the regions in which those tribes are embedded. Um, in a place like Gila River, yeah, there's a big market in Phoenix and so forth and so on. You go out into very rural places, go to Crow or Delis, for example, and the tribal government is a major employer in the whole region. Um, and so we say, give weight to that. Give weight to the employment in both the tribal enterprises and the tribal government, um, because it's important to the entire region. And, and this, this CARES Act has as a goal, an overall goal, of course, trying to offset the effects of the massive, massive economic downturn that the country is experiencing. So we say, say give weight to those employ, employees and that employee count. Um, and then lastly, with respect, to expend, with respect to expenditures, as I mentioned, it's very difficult, really logistically and administratively and from a data perspective, uh, impossible to forecast what expenditures will be out through uh, uh, the end of this year, which is what the law is supposed to cover. Um, and yet we know those expenditures both directly in terms of, you know, Governor Lewis it probably had to put green, new green t-shirts and, and hire teams to come be the green team to clean the facilities and so forth. They're, they're direct expenditures, but there's also indirect expenditures as tribes struggle with furloughing workers and trying to still maintain, say, their health insurance and so forth, these kinds of things. And so with respect to expenditures, uh, we recommend that the uh, Treasury Department use uh, a, a peer-reviewed model that is out there that basically estimates for, can estimate for all tribes, a background rate of COVID exposure and COVID, COVID threat. Um, that takes into account the land base of tribes. Large, large land-based tribes tend to be more rural. More rural places have higher levels of expenditure. Uh, greater levels of poverty, and as, as Dr. Hammett mentioned, crowding in houses, that's in this model. Uh, uh, whether you have uh, access to a good water system, we know this has been a problem, uh, particularly up at Navajo, where many Navajos don't have access to clean water, and so it's been the case that people say, well, don't wash your hands because you're using something very valuable. How do you overcome that? So the, we're trying to take into account, this model takes into account all of those, the land bases, the, the, the poverty, the ruralness uh, and so forth. And uh, it comes up with a, then a way of estimating the, the underlying expenditures, whether they be direct in fighting the disease or indirect in trying to prevent it and so forth. Um, uh, take all of that into account 60% weight on population, 20% weight on employment, 20% weight on the burden created, the expenditure burden created by the COVID-19 pandemic. We think that represents a fair way uh, to allocate monies. We say it that way because, and I'll just end with this, you're basically slicing a fixed a pie of a fixed size. And if Gila River gets a smaller piece, someone else gets a bigger piece and vice versa. No one is gonna be perfectly healthy health perfectly happy uh, with an allocation, but we have to as, as, as a nation really and across the tribal nations come up with something that's fair and recognizes the many dimensions of this pandemic. And so that's the nature of our proposal. Great, thank you for, for explaining that. We've got some questions from the audience. Uh, the first one is from Rebecca Landbeck, and she says, I've read that the federal government hasn't sent PPE, ventilators, or other critical supplies to tribal lands, but has sent body bags. Is there any truth to that? What is most needed now that volunteers might be able to help with? Maybe Laura, Dr. Hammett could start us off with, with what's needed most from a health standpoint. 
Sure, I think there have been distributions of PPE and of ventilators through the national distribution system to tribes. I don't know, speaking to what Professor Colt was just saying, how those have been allocated across tribes across the United States, but certainly there have been allocation of those uh, resources and, and deliveries of those critical supplies um, to tribes. By no means is it enough. Everywhere across the United States is facing shortages of PPE, and and fortunately now, you know, where we're seeing the the pandemic start to slow down, there are examples of places that are sending their resources um, that they have um, no longer seem to be needing as many of to other areas that are in higher higher need situations right now. Um, but I, I think you know, as was just mentioned, there needs to be a more transparent. Uh, equitable system so we know how these resources are being delivered. Right now it's very much a black box. We don't know what's going where and that makes it hard for volunteer groups and other grassroots organizations to figure out where they can help prioritize to fill gaps because it's not really clear right now where distributions um, are going. Um, I, I would say absolutely there's a room for, for volunteers to be assisting with this and certainly we've seen, you know, a, a tremendous number of sewing brigades crop up where we're, you know, helping people to be able to have masks, um, which is very useful and also um, being able to uh, help procure um, some of these much needed supplies. Um, so that's been useful. Thank you. Uh, we have another question from Lauren Jab. Uh, she says the Mashpee tribe in Massachusetts is having their sovereignty threatened. What public health risks could accompany a tribe losing its sovereignty? Um, Joe, do you want to start? <laughs> start us off there. You're on mute, Joe. Joe? I'm sure everyone's willing to jump on this question and I'll start, <laughs> but I'm sure all of our panelists have something to say. I won't go into all the details, but Governor Lewis mentioned this notion of self-governance and self-running uh, their tribal health clinics and so forth. And while it's not perfect everywhere, all of our research evidence says that this process of self-governance where tribes have taken over, not only their healthcare, but their law enforcement, their emergency response, their first responders and so forth, has generally been improving um, the, the delivery of services to tribes. It's, it's, it's quite simply the case that, uh, uh, you know, Governor Lewis sitting there, uh, if he messes up, <laughs> his, his citizens are on top of him. And that kind of uh, accountability, uh, you know, thank goodness there are people willing to shoulder that kind of responsibility like Governor Lewis, um, but that kind of accountability improves, improves the performance. And in fact, Gila River is quite famous for improving its winning awards for improving its delivery of first response and police services and healthcare services and so forth. Um, and so, and so, if you if you really take away the sovereignty of, of tribes, you actually take away the ability to hold accountable the people who are supposed to be delivering the necessary services that hold a civil society together. I'll just I'll just stop there. Governor, you must have a comment Governor on that. <laughs> well, well, yeah, and and, and I think as, as a tribal leader, um, you know, it's it's a it's a travesty what, what's going on with with, with the, the the Mashpee Nation, and we all, uh, you know, as was as, as said a lot, we all stand with Mashpee because what could happen to, to Mashpee uh, could happen to any of us, um, and you know, uh, I think definitely um, as a sovereign nation, um, and and. Uh, to exercise your sovereignty in a time of a pandemic to protect your uh, your, your tribal citizens. I mean that, uh, that that's critical. That's life and death. Um, where you know the, the, that could have you know some some fatal consequences if we if a tribal nation does not have the ability to control its borders, to control uh, its healthcare and its first responders, whether it's resources, whether it's actual. Um, jurisdiction um you know because I, I know for for um uh, for my community and i know it was even critical for for other tribes that are going through this right now uh whether it's it's the pueblos whether it's the navajo nation whether it's uh, the the eastern band of cherokees um uh, whether it's the, the 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 white mountain uh tribal uh the apache tribal nation up there our, our brothers and sisters i mean uh, i mean it's critical to have uh those uh, those aspects of self-governance where you're able to uh, 
um, uh, put through executive orders or, 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 or use your constitution, your tribal constitution to have stay at home um, standards, to have uh, travel bans, uh, you know, to, you know to, to, to be able to do those uh, in a time of, uh, you know, of a, of a public health uh, emergency and to do that timely as well. For the Gila River Indian community, you know, we're, we're charting all of our, our, our responses and we've done that sooner uh, than uh, either the, the state of Arizona or the federal government. Um, and, and I think that, that you know, and, and of course, Gila River is not the only one. We have, we have tribal nations that are doing that and that are exercising, um, you know, sometimes, you know, uh, higher standards uh, than, their, than their home states or conflicting as we see in the Northern Plains. Um, but that is a true, uh, you know, w w w w that is a, that is a, a, a true uh, outlay of, of sovereignty of acting on it. And when you don't have that, um, your tribal nation is in uh, truly uh, a precarious, dangerous situation. Yeah, hey, Megan, this is Dell. Um, I when I was in D.C., I, I had to work with the the Mashpee on a variety of fronts about their situation and. And as Governor Lewis said, it, it is a travesty. And as Professor Kalt mentioned, um, you know, they fought for many, many years just to become federally recognized to begin with in the 2000s. And then as they proceeded to try to protect their homelands, um, the, there was a Supreme, Supreme Court case that came down in 2009 that had a devastating impact on them, which was the Carcieri case. And in that case, the uh, um, they didn't allow the Narragansetts to proceed with their own housing because they weren't under federal jurisdiction, according to the court in 1934. So you have these kind of um, <clears throat> old tests that people are having to meet after the fact to go back and prove that they're under federal jurisdiction and ultimately acknowledged by the federal government so that they can get the resources, protect their land and do the types of things that you've heard uh, tribal leaders doing right now to protect their citizens. And in fact, um, it appears as the administration had withdrawn a, a very valuable Indian lands opinion that many of us had pushed for and worked on that allowed for Mashpee to move forward with protecting their homelands. And apparently that was withdrawn during this litigation. And so that there's, there's multiple layers of, of um, historic facts and uh, legal battles and, and it's unfortunate and sad that they're spending all their resources just to try to get the acknowledgement and recognition so they can use their resources to protect their citizens. And I, I, it, it just, um, it, it, to face all of those types of things has got to be extremely challenging. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, I agree. Um, I think we have time for, for one last question. It comes in from Krat1. Um, and Krat is wondering uh, what specific examples uh, might you be able to give of a nonprofit or a neighboring community uh, providing assistance uh, to a tribal nation that was useful during this crisis? Um, maybe Governor Lewis, are there any uh, sort of nonprofits that uh, is, are working in partnership with Gila River um, that you can speak to? Well, you know, I know that there are a number now, and, and, and yeah, I think every day, you know, you see more um, uh, more activity in that nonprofit sector as well, that or even the, the, the NGO sector as well. I mean, you so I see that uh, uh, in our um, up in northern Arizona uh, with, with the Navajo Nation, um, just an incredible amount of activity up there. Um, and uh, I think uh, uh, Professor Kalt, I know one of our uh, our our, our classmates um she started a gofundme site that just was at just right at a critical time at the beginning where where there was no activity at all um uh and that's that's of course miss uh, ethel branch i know she's a, a new mother now um but started and, and i think from you know from um I, I think that that shows um that there is a need for grassroots um especially our especially sometimes our own tribal members as well I have a lot of tribal members that are, um, that uh, you know, are, are reaching out uh, beyond our, our our borders with sewing projects, uh, sewing masks, uh, helping our own tribal members in in 
uh, urban settings as well. Um, I know one of, uh, you know, some of our, our, our Native American, I wouldn't call them celebrities, but, uh, but uh, especially in New Mexico, uh, Mr. Nota Begay and his foundation has, been, they've been, uh, you know, very active, I know in New Mexico, but also in Navajo as well. Um, and, and so, you know, you see these, these uh, I think, good examples uh, that are sprouting up. And I, then you see tribes helping other tribes as well. Uh, you know, for us, you know, we, we're building on our, on, our, on our testing plan. We're gonna be, um, we're testing our tribal employees now uh, uh, for a phased reopening as well. Uh, so we're, we're testing, so we're, we've, uh, I think, tested almost 6,000 tests so far. And so we're looking, and we've also, are, I'm working with, with uh, you know, our sister tribes here in Arizona about replicating as a, as, as a, uh, as a best practice, as a gold standard uh, for, for other tribes as well. Yeah. Well, and I know uh, we at the Harvard Project have been um, in contact with uh, the Native American Advancement Foundation uh, at the Thanawatham Nation, who uh, is working in partnership with the Gogu District uh, to provide food yes. and educational materials uh, to the citizens there. So um, it's all hands on deck, and and you know we've got a long road ahead, and and hopefully um, we'll come out come out stronger when all is said and done. Um, we are at the end of our session and I want to give a special thanks to our panelists. Um, we're, we're really grateful for the work that each of you do every day um, and your dedication to, to see Indian country through this. Um, if you're if you're interested in learning more about our, more about our work on COVID-19, uh, reading some of the policy briefs that Joe mentioned, uh, learning what other tribal nations are doing, including Gila River, um, and learning about the efforts of the John Hopkins Center for American Indian Health. Uh, please go ahead and, and check out our nation building toolbox on COVID-19 specifically. Uh, you can find it at nationbuildingtoolbox.com. Uh, so again, thank everybody uh, for being here for today and spending some time with us. And I hope you all uh, keep safe. So thank you. Thanks, Megan. Thanks, everyone. Our pleasure. Bye, team. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat>